Institutes. So today we're going to hear about interannual variability in the eddying North Atlantic Ocean from Quinton and colleagues at Florida State. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you for the uh, introduction. Um, so yeah, I'm Quentin Jamet, so work at the postdoc uh, at the FSU, Florida State University, with William Jewell, Nicola Winders, and uh, Bruno de Rang. And so I'm going to speak uh, about the internal viability in the North Atlantic, focusing on the AMOC and uh, when eddies are resolved. So for the motivation of the overall project, uh, it stems from uh, earlier work done by uh, Thierry Pinduf and collaborator, where they show that the uh, mesoscale activities uh, actually have some implications at low frequency uh, from one to 10 years. So to illustrate that, I retrieve uh, the map from a paper of uh, Guillaume Sarazin and collaborator in 2015, where they uh, show an, a map of the intrinsic, uh, ratio of the intrinsic viability over the total viability. So basically, the intrinsic viability is the viability that is generated by the system itself, like, in the, like non linearities. And the total viability accounts for everything. Uh, so uh, intrinsic viability plus uh, forcing via, force viability. And so the, this map deals with the uh, sea level anomaly, uh, where the ratio can go from 0% up to 100% in purple. So there is clear regions where there is no contribution of the uh, intrinsic viability, but there is also large regions where the intrinsic viability contributes uh, quite importantly to the total viability. And those regions are many regions uh, known as being pretty AD active. So in our, in our work, what we specify only, we, we work only, we are only interested in the North Atlantic regions. Uh, in a rectangle here, and we want to go deeper into characterizing the forced or intrinsic uh, uh, viability in the domain, and also uh, assess the local or remote region, uh, so meaning that either the, the viability is generated inside the domain or it's generated somewhere else and goes into the domain by southern or, or northern open boundary conditions. So for, for that, we set up a uh, 12 of the degree horizontal resolution regional configuration of the North Atlantic, the MIT GCM. So the domain considered is here. It extends to 20 south to 55 north. Uh, the open boundaries are set on the south north. And also, we take into account the effect of the Mediterranean Sea through the Strait of Gibraltar outflow. This configuration is integrated over 50 years uh, with an ensemble strategy made out of 12 members, and uh, we ran four different experiments. So the four experiments are made by permuting the atmospheric or the open boundary condition as being climatological or fully varying. And so far, we have completed only the two configurations with uh, fully varying atmospheric conditions. And I'm going to mainly uh, focus today on this one, uh, the, the, the configuration uh, that the experiment, sorry, uh, that runs with fully varying open boundary conditions and atmosphere. A little bit uh, of details on the um, uh, configuration. So the ocean model is coupled to an atmospheric boundary layer model named as GPML. So the philosophy of this uh, boundary layer model that over the land, uh, all atmospheric uh, fields, temperature, humidity, wind, radiative fluxes, and precipitation are described. But over the ocean, the temperature and the humidity in the atmosphere are free to evolve, and they follow an advection diffusion equation. And then uh, the fluxes between the, uh, uh, the atmospheric boundary layer model and the ocean as computed following the core three formulation. Um, yeah, all, the, uh, all the atmospheric data uh, have been provided by the DFS 4.4. So uh, <clears throat> I'm going to give you the conclusions I'd like to reach today. So there are uh, two main conclusions I'd like to reach. So um, first, I'm going to show that we the, the con this configuration nicely reproduces the high frequency viability at the rapid location, and we're going to identify this viability as being forced. 
and also uh, show that there is a, a lot of uh, low frequency, uh, meaning like larger than 10 years, uh, variability at the rapid location that is intrinsic by nature. So the first uh, first, in, uh, first insight I'm going to give is the what we simulate as a mean state. Uh, so in the upper right, um, it's the 50-year uh, time mean uh, AMOC for, for a given member, so extended from 20 south to 55 north. So we have an upper cell um, above 3,000 meters and, and, uh, and a an, uh, lower negative cell uh, at the bottom. So it's associated with no swap flow at the surface. There is thinking happening outside from the domain and the return flow reenter into the domain um, by through the open boundary. And the uh, negative cell uh, represents the penetration of the Antarctic bottom uh, water in the North Atlantic. So the strategy uh, used to output uh, data has been to use five-day average. And uh, looking at this five-day average data, we have a very high uh, viability centered at the equator and maximum at 2,000 meter depth, uh, which reaches 30%, 30 is reps. Uh, but this uh, high viability is nicely filtered out with a uh, low-pass filter with a cutoff uh, frequency of two months. And at the bottom panel, I show you the the, the simulated uh, AMOC viability uh, at the rapid location and at the depth of uh, 1,300 meters. So the gray lines are the realization for the 12 different uh, members. Uh, the black one is the uh, mean of all these 12 members, and we compare that with the rapid, uh, rapid data, which are in blue. So we see that we are, uh, the model underestimates the first uh, years of the recall, uh, but comes better at the end. And also, we see that there is clearly a, clear, a good agreement at uh, higher frequency, like interannual and uh, sub-annual uh, viability. So the interest is to uh, <coughs> identify the viability of the AMOC as being forced or intrinsic. So the, the way we're going to do that is using a statistical approach based on the uh, use of an ensemble. So we have um, 12 different realization, uh, which are forced with the same uh, atmospheric and boundary forcing, but the different in the initial conditions. And so these uh, 12 different uh, members have common patterns uh, and specific patterns. So the common patterns is uh, assessed by um, averaging all the members uh, together and uh, uh, having out the uh, getting out the uh, fourth viability, which is represented here uh, in blue, which is common to all members, so by nature. And the intrinsic viability is computed at the uh, residual um, for each member. So each intrinsic viability would be specific to a member, rather than the fourth viability would be common to all members. And the additional processing that has been made for what I'm going to show after that the, all data has been uh, yearly, aver yearly averaged, and uh, there has been a high pass filter with a cutoff frequency of 50 years. Now the <coughs> okay, so, uh, so uh, similar to what uh, Guillaume Serres and collaborator have done for the sea level anomaly, we compute here uh, intrinsic to total um, ratio map uh, for the AMOC. Uh, so we have uh, the same color code. Blue is no contribution of the intrinsic viability. Red and purple, very high contribution. So the signal of intrinsic viability is mainly confined and at depth and north of 20 north. Uh, but there is an, an incursion at the, in the all water column uh, around 40 north, uh, which is the uh, location where the Gulf Stream separates. So it might have some implication for that. And also, if we look at the rapid location, uh, we have some some uh, places like specifically 3,000 meter depth, where the intrinsic variability uh, reaches 60% of the uh, total variability. So this is this is a map for the all volumes accounted for uh, the, uh, the the AMOC, and we're gonna now the 
specify uh, the uh, force and uh, um, sorry the, uh, the 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 pattern uh, slash sample pattern of this variability. So for that we use the principal component analysis. And so I show here the results of the uh, first and second EOF computed for the uh, fourth signal. So we have um, um, barotropic signature uh, everywhere in the basin. In the first EOF, there is a chain of sign at 40 north, which corresponds to the change of sign in wind and associated with at atmospheric forcing. And for the second EOF, we have the uh, the presence of a mode here in the south that is uh, that, that originate from the South Atlantic and enter by the boundary. So if we do now the same for the intrinsic variability, we end up for this is the result for a specific members. So we have done that for the 12 Dachshund members, but they all share the same patterns. And we can uh, separate the basin in two areas, north and south of 25 or 26.4 uh, north, which is the, the location of rapid, uh, rapid array. So north of, this, uh, north of the array, the signal is mainly barotropic and uh, the relatively small scale, meso scale. Uh, and it, the maximum uh, take place here again, like uh, just south of 40 north, which is the location where the bus will separate. And the south of 26.5 north, the, the signal is, is uh, much broader, much large scale. And it's bar mostly barotropic bar bar uh, for the first EOF and baroconic signature in the uh, second EOF. So those uh, those empirical orthogonal function they are associated with principal component and uh, we can make a Fourier transform out of that uh, to have a spectrum and uh, the so the Fourier transform uh, the power spectrum for the first uh, signal is represented here for uh, on the left for the first principal component so the first signal is in blue sorry and. Uh, and with that, we have the average uh, power spectrum for the intrinsic variability, so an average, average over the 12 members. And so on the left, we have the first principal component. On the right, we have the second principal component. So we identify uh, a couple of spots. Uh, in the first principal component, there is this fourth signal uh, at two to three years, which is associated with the, um, with the NIO forcing. Uh, as I said earlier, and on the for the second uh, principal component of the fourth signal, we also have a, sin, a signal at around 10 years, uh, which might be also related to an atmospheric forcing at lower scales, but no firm conclusions can be drawn out of that so far. And for the intrinsic uh, intrinsic variability, so looking at the green curve, uh, we have predominantly a, 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 a nice a nice peak here uh, between 12 and 20 years, uh, which uh, is dictated clearly with the uh, fourth variability. So if we replace this result uh, in, uh, with what in the, on the time series I showed you earlier, uh, comparing with the rapid array. So uh, if you remember, uh, if you remember, so we have three. We are underestimating the, 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 re, the what what is measured at the beginning of the record. Uh, we become pretty pretty good at the end, and uh, also there is a good agreement with the for, uh, for, with the variability at yeah uh, seasonal and up to two, two years. So the the fact that we're good in uh, at below two years uh, is can be interpreted as uh, the fourth signal uh, that we see. And the fact that we are uh, not that good uh, at lower frequency uh, might be related to uh, the presence of an intrinsic uh, low frequency variability in what is measured by the rapid array. So that makes, uh, that makes it pretty uh, difficult to reconstruct, simulate. And so to reach out on the conclusion, um, the, uh, so the, we, have, we are pretty happy about what we simulate at the lower frequencies at two years. And uh, so uh, and, and this, uh, these variabilities can be interpreted as a fourth variability. Uh, and the, uh, the, 
the decomposition into intrinsic and force variability also show the appearance of a low frequency mode at lower frequency, like 10 years, and which is uh, which, which is present in, at the rapid location. And also the third uh, conclusion I haven't discussed that much, but I'd like to point that uh, is that the uh, method we set up for uh, differentiating the local versus the remote origin of the variability seems to work pretty well uh, because we have a pre the presence of a South Atlantic mode that can be removed, filtered out by uh, specifying an open boundary condition as climatological. And so the three further investigation we'd like to go through is to, ident to identify the, the three-dimensional patterns that are associated with the mode of viability I, I, I sh I've shown here. And also uh, go, in much, go more into details about the dynamics that face this mode. And the third uh, point of interest would be to compute the energetics of the wind driven circulation. And on that, I'd like to thank you, all of you. Great, thanks, Quentin. Um, we can take some questions now. So if you have questions, just remember raise your hand or type them in the chat feature. Um, so let me go through kind of in the order I saw hands shoot up. And I think, Steve, I saw your hand go up first. Steve, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, my question is, um, how does this conclusion about intrinsic low frequency variability at 26.5 north related to the fact that you have open boundary conditions at 55 north? So you're basically, um, you, you may have some issues associated with forced thermohaline variations coming out of the lab C, and what are those boundary conditions exactly that you are uh, applying? So the, uh, the open boundary condition we used are uh, retrieved from the 12th of a degree run, uh, run by a Thierry Pandif and collaborator. And, um, uh, so they have same resolution, uh, same uh, yeah, temporal and spatial resolution. And uh, if we uh, we run the uh, we've run the, um, the 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 experiments where we set up the uh, the climatological open boundary condition. Uh, so I have something here to show you. Uh, so this is the uh, the, the difference uh, between the uh, so the run using fully varying open boundary conditions, and on the bottom is the run uh, using climatological open boundary conditions. So this is the second EOF. The first EOF shows really similar uh, patterns, uh, both in time and space. And uh, here, so we can can see that by specifying climatological open boundary conditions, there is the, we delete you know, delete the, yeah, the the mode at the south that is present when forcing with the full boundary condition, but it doesn't seem to penetrate much into the inter like north of the equator. So I would say that uh, the, there is not that much connection between what, what happened at the boundary and what, what can be seen uh, in the uh, rapid array. And northern Yeah, yeah. Great, thanks. Steve, do you have anything else before I move on? No, you can move on. Thank you. Uh, Wilbert, please go ahead. Uh, uh, thanks, Sam. Uh, thanks, Quentin. That was, that was a really interesting, uh, interesting presentation. Um, I have a question about your interpretation of the, the modes in terms of barotropic and baroclinic. Uh, would you mind um, going back to that slide and maybe explaining it a little better? Because you're looking at EUFs of the overturning stream function, right? Which in its in a sense is a kind of a bare clinic feature by by definition. Yes. So uh, the, uh, the 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 signal the uh, the, the mode uh, the mode of the EOF is uh, barotropic exactly, uh, but the uh, so the um, station of the uh, uh, the uh, like AMOC itself the um, thing you have. Uh, the uh, like barotropic signature in the sense that you're gonna like increase or decrease the uh, the, the strength uh, and the 
with the stimulus and put it on the, on the vertical, uh, I would say. But, but it looks like the maximum of vari variance is, is around um, 1,000 meters or 1,500 meters or so. so yeah. I mean, if it's just a bear, if just Eggman transport moving stuff northward and a barotropic response moving stuff southward uh, below the Eggman layer, then you would expect that to be kind of depth in, kind of have a maximum just at the surface, right? Or no, we not say so. Um, I, I have. I, it, it looks to be uh, um, this is quite consistent with uh, what you have in the uh, in climate models. Uh, so still have to uh, get some work on the uh, island. What what how like what separate the first and second mode? Because I don't really get why they are. Uh, but what difference between uh, those two modes if they are uh, we like face them uh, from that? But. Mm, I know. I think um, I think it's something pretty, uh, pretty, pretty consistent with the uh, with the uh, um, uh, uh, atmospheric uh, uh, response. Uh, yeah. Hi, uh, Dr. V. You're Bill Dewar. Sorry to butt uh, to butt in. If I, if I can, if we can go back to uh, you know the mean, the mean, yeah. So you notice that there are these these patterns. You have a maximum and stream function here, and so I think the barotropic structure that we're seeing is if you if you take this and you kind of jiggle it around this way a bit, then you sort of get a common top to bottom response in the overturning cell. So it, it's associated with the variability of this thing, which I think ends up being um, kind of depth independent in its expression. Uh huh. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm not seeing it right away, but um, yeah. that's that's just my limited abilities, cognitive abilities, I suppose. <laughs> I, I, uh, Wilbur, maybe you can follow up with them um, if you guys have some more questions. So, sure. Good. Thank, thank you. you. Alrighty. Great. Uh, Gokhan, did you have a question? Yeah, I had the same question. One of them was exactly what Wilbur asked, and I don't think that it's a barotropic mode, and I don't know. The, uh, the, the second question that I had is, what is the time temporal resolution of the data set that you are using to compute the US? Is it monthly or annual? Uh, it's, the, uh, it's annual average uh, AMOC. Okay, and then what is the pattern uh, that you are seeing in the EOFs around 35 degrees north? Is it associated with the Mediterranean outflow? Uh, yeah, in all so of the EOFs, you see that 35 or whatever, 36 degree difference. 35 here, you say? Well, yeah, that, you see, it, it is, there is a maximum south of like roughly 36 north. There is a minimum region and then there is another maximum. And that shows up in all of your EOFs. What's the reason for that? Um, so this... Uh, the the way I interpret that so far is this is the uh, fourth signal and so it's uh, the, the 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 location of the minimum here is like in a sense left for the expressions of the intrinsic uh, signal, which is uh, maximum at the exact same location. Uh, so this is the way I interpret that. And yeah, yeah, yeah. It's the uh, lo lo location of the uh, like uh, gulf, gulf stream that separates from the coast, so making some meanders. So um, yeah, and uh, so there is a, a, a part which here get, like seems to be much forced by the atmospheric forcing rather than uh, on the. And you have also a much uh, shorter contribution of the intrinsic variability just at the way at the location where the Gulf Stream separates. And do you have the Mediterranean outflow in this model? Yeah. And where's the signal of that? Uh, if that is the same signal, what is, where's the signal of the Mediterranean outflow, I guess that's what I'm asking. Um, 
I won't have any straight answer because I don't really know what uh, what the signal of Mediterranean three the aim of actually. Uh, I don't know what it's supposed to look like, so I I'm not really able to answer to that question. Thanks, Gokhan. Do you have anything else to follow up with? No, oh, thank you. Thanks, Gokhan. Mike, Mike, did you have a question? I did. Um, it, it sort of been asked already, but I'll just kind of reformulate into another question. Um, first off, I, I kind of like your uh, set of experiments you're doing. I'm wondering, looking at this slide now, the intrinsic variability, um, I don't see much of it penetrating to the southern boundary. Um, do you think, or to the northern boundary, it seems to be kind of confined. Is, is there any way to tell if your boundary conditions are suppressing large-scale intrinsic modes? Or do you think it's confined to mid-latitudes because of the equator and, uh, say, topography and the sub gyre or something like that? Um, uh, I would, uh, so the, uh, for me, the, uh, the, the, the experiments we did there, uh, everything that enters uh, on the north on the, by the south uh, will be uh, explicitly uh, at the forced, in, in the, uh, put in the forced uh, mode, uh, since they are, they are they are forced by the boundaries. So after what goes, uh, what will uh, express in the intrinsic uh, part will be the uh, um, the the effect of, like for instance, modifying a mean state and something like that uh, through the uh, open boundary. Right. Um, so I'm wondering if, if, for example, your southern boundary was further to the south, would the intrinsic mode extend further southward? Um, or is it I understand your boundary conditions are forced by definition, so I'm wondering if they're influencing the large-scale intrinsic modes. The, uh, the, the paper of uh, the study that I've computed in the um, uh, Le, Le, Le Roux and collaborator, they, they actually highlight that this mode that here is forced because it, it's imposed by the boundary. If you extend uh, south for the boundary, the, the domain, uh, it's uh, the I, they identify this mode as being intrinsic here. Oh, okay. Modes where we have climatological boundary conditions, significant portions of the EOS are very much the same. So, to us, a statement that a significant chunk of the EOS structure is very insensitive to what we're doing at the boundary. And that's true in the intrinsic modes as well as the force mode. Okay. Great. Thanks, Mike. Um, any last minute questions here? We're right about our time, but we could take one more if someone had something pressing. 